Amen. Please remain standing as we read God's Word together. Today we're looking at Matthew 27, verses 33 through 37. Matthew 27, verses 33 through 37. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they gave him wine to drink mixed with gall, and after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. And sitting down, they began, they began to keep watch over him there, and above his head they put up the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that your Holy Spirit preaches to each and every one of our hearts and that uh, uh, today's sermon, Lord, is provided by uh, you, Lord. And so, Lord, um, we pray that we encounter you through your word, that conviction is brought here today, Lord, and restoration takes place here today. We thank you, Lord, for the preaching of your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Last week, we kind of talked about attitudes uh, towards Jesus, and we're going to continue on with that theme, but today we're going to talk about worship. And worship is one of those conversations that can be quite easy to talk about, and then all of a sudden it quickly just kind of turns into an intense conversation, it can turn into an intense debate. Uh, people people uh, either take their worship so seriously is why it becomes so intense, or they get offended so easily, which is why it can become so intense. And so today we're going to talk about worship in general, um, and uh, we're going to consider a few things, because um, we, we live in a time where we really got to have a, a, a theology of worship and really consider what worship is and what it is not, and the dangers that we commit when it is not proper worship. Now, this ministry here, just uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna go through a little history lesson a bit, guys, when it comes to worship. But this ministry here has always preferred classic hymns. Um, uh, it never denied any type of contemporary Christian music. This ministry, as far as I know, um, you know, when I, when I got here, we had these red booklets. Remember these red booklets that we had? They were the uh, Maranatha booklets, and uh, they, they were falling apart, which is why we stopped using them so much, because we didn't really have a whole bunch. They were just get, they were used so much that they were just kind of falling apart, and they just weren't becoming easy to use. And so um, we still, that it was, it was very much contemporary-style Christian songs that were in those books, um, in those little booklet, booklets. And so when those started to wear out, we kind of went into, okay, let the first song be some type of, whatever song it could be any song um but uh these booklets are no longer holding together usually they were really short ones too really short ones so we would squeeze in a few uh at the start of service um and so there, th this ministry has always kind of been a a, a hymn focused ministry but it hasn't been exclusively hymns now when you go to other churches they may have strictly contemporary music there um and rarely do they ever bring in any type of what we would call classic hymn. If they're singing a classic hymn, it's because some new contemporary artist came out with a new song that is a kind of a remake of a classic hymn with some new uh, some new catchy chorus to it or something along that lines. That's that's usually Chris Tomlin that's doing that, by the way. Um, and so Chris Tomlin just takes old hymns and throws in a new catchy chorus, and, and that's how they kind of become repopular. Then you have what's called modern-day hymns, where some contemporary songwriters want to carry on the tradition of folk singing. And that's typically what hymn music is. It's related to what we have been what we now call folk singing. But that's not an easy word to define because you have American traditional folk, you have Irish folk, you have English folk, and there's no one brand or style. So it really doesn't explain much. Um, and now that word folk is kind of just used fairly loosely anymore. It's just everyone wants, you know, you got kind of your um, new age hipsters that kind of want to bring back a folk thing and they think that's what they're doing. But uh, 
They're usually not. Now that term traditionally comes from folklore, which has been defined as oral, oral traditions communicated of the culture and of the subculture. That's what folklore is. It's oral traditions that are communicated of the culture and subculture. Now you have to understand that these phrases came at a time when not everybody had the ability to read. And these hymns came at a time when, not, when everybody didn't have the ability to read. And this style came about at a time when not everyone had the ability to read. And so folklore and folk music was always a way to get people to sing along. That's why they're kind of more simpler style songs. They couldn't read the music or the lyrics to the music, but they were simple enough to understand and to memorize and get you to sing along with them. And so the purpose of folk music was to get the, the common man of these times to be able to learn something, memorize something, and something that was true of the culture. Even if it was a work of fiction, the song could be a work of fiction, uh, it still represented the culture in some way. And so it was reminiscent of their very culture. But the idea behind folk music and folklore was that it was meant to be a simple type of storytelling and a simple way of music so that everybody can be included. So they tend to stick with notes and melody that's easy to sing along with. And so there's not going to be like, uh, you know, you're not going to see folk music that are hitting Whitney Houston kind of notes, right? It's just not going to work that way because the common man can't sing that way. And so it's always kind of designed to be for the common man, the people who are not the Whitney Houstons of the world. So there are people today who want to carry on that tradition, something that's easy to sing along to, something that's easy to memorize, uh, and um, it, it makes the music simple enough for everybody. And the modern day hymns have an instrument ensemble that sounds more modern as say early 19th century or 18th century. <laughs> And again, this is carrying on with a tradition or communicating something while maintaining an aspect of the current culture. And so that's why some of the contemporary hymns, the newer hymns, may sound very close to contemporary music instrumentally because it's part of the culture. So some people, modern day hymn writers, may not, some of their music may not sound a whole lot different than certain contemporary Christian artists as far as the instrument goes, but there is a difference between the two. The modern day hymn writers have the motive of communicating a specific kind of truth and making sure that it can easily be memorized through the medium of a song. It is a song with educational aspect to it. It's a tool of education meant to help you help us and better equip us. And so this is the motive behind what we would call modern day hymns. It is meant to help us know the word, understand the word, know our theology, understand doctrines when we sing about it. And it's a tool to help us memorize. And so when you think of a modern day hymn, something like in Christ alone would be a modern day hymn. And that has uh, theology in it that helps us memorize certain uh doctrines within the Bible. That's the purpose of a modern day hymn. It's to communicate truth and, and, and it's a way that's easy to sing along to and easy to memorize. Whereas the contemporary Christian artist does not share the same motive, not strictly or exclusively. The contemporary Christian artist has the same motive as any other type of musical artist, which is selling records, breaking charts. Okay, because they're being judged by selling records and breaking charts. They're not going to be invited by a studio to come in and record a record, record an album if they don't sell. And so they have a different motive. They got to make sure they're still making sales. And if they're not making sales, they're not going to get the offers. So there's a difference in motivation there. So their songs tend to be a little bit more vague. They're not very uh, educational. And they tend to really, really 
depend on your emotions, so it becomes quite emotional. Now, you also have to add the fact that, generally speaking, both are trying to bring worship to God. Generally speaking, they're both trying to bring worship to God. There might be some artists where they can be questionable about if that's what they're generally trying to do. That's why I say generally speaking. Um, and there are, I think, artists out there we must question. But both groups, whether you're a modern-day hymn writer or a contemporary Christian artist, are capable of accomplishing uh, this goal of bringing worship to God. Okay, Both groups can, can do this. Both can also completely mess it up. That is possible. Uh, so now, briefly talking about this, this history behind it, we kind of have to come to this modern-day worship service. And this is where people tend to get a little touchy. There are people who say, I cannot worship to that old stuff. You know, I was talking about hymns and whatnot, and even older than hymns. I cannot worship to that old stuff. I can only worship to what I know and what I like. I have heard these conversations time and time again. But then there's this attitude that the older hymns are the only things that are holy and no contemporary song could possibly be that way. Now we have to have the proper attitude when it comes to worship. And the first thing that we must emphasize is we bring our worship here. When we step in through those doors and we come here, we are bringing our worship here. The music does not magically stir up worship within us. We bring our worship here. If you are waiting for any type of song we sing to magically stir up worship within you, within you, you are automatically getting off to the wrong start. Human beings, creatures, bring their worship here. So if you have this idea that I cannot worship to this style, then you're not bringing your worship. You're trusting in the music that it's gonna that it's gonna do this to you, that's gonna generate it in you, but you're really not worshiping. You, the music is causing an emotional sensation within you, but it's not worship. Now, if we want to get to the long story short version of proper worship and what is proper the proper songs to be sung in church, the long story short is whatever is theologically rich, what songs we can sing that glorify God and edify our understanding of the truth. And when you have that motive and you're, you're, you're a ministry that's looking, hey, this music must be theologically rich, it must glorify God, and it must be for the edification of truth. When you find the ministries that have that in line, where that is the motive, and that alone is the motive, it's, it's for that, you're going to find that most of them do not have contemporary music. That's what you will find. Or at least minimal amount of contemporary music. They'll have some contemporary songs but the contemporary songs will have that same goal in mind. But it's not as common with the contemporary crowd. Now, there are people who I think will overthink it. For example, the Newsboys has a song called We Believe. I'll be honest, I'm not a big fan of that group. I think uh, they're better with their newer lineup. For sure. But out of all the years that group has been around, I think I, I think I can only stomach a, a small handful of their music. Like, if I ever come in here and I say, hey, we need to sing the Newsboys song, Shine, uh, then you know I have died and it's an imposter. It's not me. Or, I'm being held hostage and I'm communicating in code that something's wrong, okay? If I say, hey, guys, today I think we should sing Shine, something's wrong, okay? Um, it's, not, it's not me or I'm being held hostage. It's code. But the song We Believe is not a bad song, and I've heard some people say, well, it's very self-centered. 
You know, it's 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 uh it's a lot of wee 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 I I I and I'm just like, well, if that's the case, you're really not going to like the Apostles' Creed. So some people are just looking to be critical is my point. Now all of this to say that there's an attitude that exists within worship and there's an attitude uh, there's an attitude towards a specific style of worship as well. If I walk into a contemporary worship church, I can still worship there to a degree. Okay? To a degree because some contemporary songs are that bad. There are just some songs that that are so bad they should never be sung in church, and they are. Or they come and they were written by groups that should never be platformed in churches. There are some groups, some contemporary Christian artists, who should not even be considered any of their music to be sung inside of a church setting because they are that bad of wolves. And it may be where the song is not so theologically bad, the specific song they may be singing, but it's the ministry behind that music that is concerning, where you know it's coming from a false church, and you know that it is wolves that belong to that church, and you should never advertise or encourage wolves leading your worship. Now, the thing about contemporary Christian music is that it's, it's done out of Nashville. Most of it's recorded out of Nashville, okay? And Nashville has a different setup of when it comes to music than most other places. Nashville actually has a design where typically you have songwriters who are trying to work their way to becoming singers. And so before you can be considered, uh, given the opportunity to become an artist, they typically want to see some songwriting from you first, they give it to some already existing artists, and you work your way towards that goal. So this is true of Christian music, because that's the way Nashville does it, and that's where most Christian music is recorded is in Nashville. And this is true of country music as well, as again, they are mostly um, recorded in Nashville. And so much of the uh, Christian albums that you guys have heard have been recorded in studios where country music has been recorded, uh, because it's pretty much the same same setup, same getup over there. Uh, Chris Stapleton right now is probably, you know, the 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 country Christian, or the country, he's not Christian, the country artist that's get, becoming very well known. That guy was a songwriter for so many years before they allowed him to sing. And the reason why they didn't allow him to sing is because they're like, you don't fit the look. Okay, you don't look like what we want you to look like. And then eventually uh, people heard his talent and they were like, okay, uh, this guy needs to record albums, and now he's he's very well known. But that's that's Nashville, guys. You got to be a songwriter before they let you be a singer. And much of the Christian music are recorded in the same studio. So there are some artists out there who have sung songs that they have never wrote, but the artists themselves should never be encouraged. And yet, some of these artists that should never be encouraged have sung songs that. Again, not written by them, but they sang them, and it's like, okay, these songs are pretty decent, but the artist is not. And so one that comes to mind is a group called Phillips, Craig, and Dean. And they're known for the Revelation song. Not written by them, and it was actually, there was a recording of it that existed three years before they actually released their version. Their version definitely made it... Uh, made it popular, but it existed at least three years prior to that point. Phillips, Craig, and Dean are Oneness Pentecostals. They are Oneness Pentecostals. They do not believe in a triune God, a.k.a. they are not Christian. They are not Trinitarian in any way. They deny so many aspects of biblical doctrine. These guys are not Christians. And yet, without hesitation, they go into the studio... And they sing, holy, holy, holy. Without even thinking about it. So as long as you know that the songs are not coming from people, so I know they didn't write that song. But I also know that they're, that they're non-Christians. And then there are other groups like that too. Where they maybe confess a triune God, but the, you know their ministries are a ministry of wolves. I'm thinking of 
something like Hillsong or Bethel should never be encouraged in any sound church. But if I walk into a contemporary Christian church and within reason I can bring my worship to the music as long as it is truly worship. There are some Christian songs out there that are not worship at all, and yet they're sung in churches all the time. Now, this is where we got to make a distinction. There are Christian artists out there that have songs where it, it's not worship, but it's, a, it's Christian, if that makes sense. And so it's, it's, it's not strictly meant to be a song of worship, but you know there's... there's, there's uh, an element of Christianity there. It's somebody who uh, who's clearly a Christian, but they're singing a song uh, that's not worship, but they got they got music of an experience they had or something they went through, and that's fine. That's fine as long as we keep it in in that area and not trying to make it worship. Worship music should always be God centered, all the time. And if there are certain songs that are not God-centered, but they're Christian, we just need to keep that separate, okay? And so, maybe singing a song about give me your eyes for just one moment is not the appropriate song for worship. When it's about one man's experience of seeing people at the airport and just wanting to have sympathy on them, okay? It's a Christian song that does not equal a worship song. Worship music should be God-centered at all times, and it should be a type of preaching as well. And so it can be a little self-centered as long as it's in the format of preaching. This is an aspect of music that most people typically do not realize that what is taking place. What people commonly think, it's on the Christian radio, it's a Christian song, it should be sung in the Christian church. No. No. Worship music must be worship music. It's fine that it's a Christian song. We're not criticizing Christian music. So again, it's probably not the best to sing certain songs that may be Christian, but not exactly worship. It's not to say that it's not a Christian song. We're not saying that at all. But what we are saying is it's not the same as a worship song. And this is what's not thought about. The common people going, oh, I know this song. I can sing along to this song. I got it, and I'm, I'm hip to it, and they sing it along in a church setting. But it's not a worship song. And it's not thought about in this contemporary church setting. And I've been involved in many conversations behind church doors where the common attitude is, okay, guys, let's think about our worship for a second. Let's think about what we're doing. And the common attitude and response is, we got to play something that the people know. If they don't know it, they won't come. Good grief. I mean, behind church, inside the church walls, it should be what glorifies God, not what's going to bring people. How can we magnify God with our worship? How can we magnify God with the songs that we sing? But most conversations behind the walls and closed doors of churches is that we have to give them the Christian music that they know. Otherwise, they won't come. Now, I'll agree, it is easier to sing along to a song that you're familiar with. There's no doubt about that at all. But it does not have to be a song you know in order for you to bring worship. Now, on the other side of the attitude, there are people who refuse to bring their worship to any type of contemporary music, uh, whether they deem it New Age hymn or, or, or uh, a, a contemporary Christian track. There's people out there where hymns and hymns alone are the only church-appropriate music and, and the only worship uh, appropriate is, is that. And there's some people where you go, well, what about singing some of the psalms? And they go, absolutely not. Hymns only. And then you have people who will argue about the type of instruments inside of a church. Which ones are holy and which ones are not holy. And then they kind of lose sight of the worship. And they lose sight of bringing worship to God. And, 
and magnifying him and magnifying his truth and magnifying his word all through the medium of song. I mean, some say a guitar is absolutely evil and should not exist in the church. Pianos, though, should. I go, they're both string instruments. What's the difference? Never get an answer. I remember when I first became a Christian, I was going through YouTube and just looking at different preachers, and this guy was talking about how these young people uh, invited him to a coffee shop that they were a Christian band, and, and he decided to check him out, and he said that, and he goes, and then he came up with the guitars, and I was like, ooh, this is going to be bad, and then they strummed the guitar, and at that first strum, demons flew out of the guitar and came right at me, and it's like, did that really happen? Or are you a wolf who's trying to manipulate other people because you, you're on this crusade of a guitar? Stringed instruments in the, in, the, in the pages of Scripture, by the way. David played a drum, but no drums allowed in the church. Isn't that weird? Now, I get it. I would not like drums in this church simply because of the size of the building. It, it, would, it would rock our ears like you wouldn't believe. And so... Uh, and that's true of a lot of churches, so they have them in soundproof cages, which I just think makes the drum sound weird to begin with. And so it's like, um, you know, pick and choose your battles, whatever. Uh, acoustics may play into if this is either wise or not, but these people are not asking themselves if this is a wise instrument to have in this specific building. They're saying it's either holy or it's evil. And they decide what it is. What about the ukulele? Where does that stand? I've never seen a depressed person play a ukulele. It's too happy of an instrument. But it's a stringed instrument, right? But I do think that there are styles that are appropriate, and then I think there are styles that are inappropriate. And I just recently heard about this. I didn't read into it. I just kind of heard about it. But now they got uh, a heavy metal church. And they're planting, I think they got five plants already of heavy metal church. Uh, I don't know what that looks like. I don't care to know what that looks like. I have zero interest, zero desire to even see what that looks like. Um, I picture a lot, of, a lot of dudes wearing black t-shirts and spiky hair. That's what I got in my mind, but I don't know because I don't know what it looks like. But there's more to worship than just the music. Everybody thinks it's, it's, it's the music. And the music alone, there's, there's actually way more to worship that's going on there. And see, we got so wrapped up in, in music and the type of music and who's performing what that we actually lost sight of what all of what worship is. And, and it's not just the music. The pinnacle point of worship is the preaching of God's word. And so if you're wrapped up in the style of music, you haven't even stopped to consider is the preaching biblical? Is the preaching theological is the preaching designed for the edification of the saints and lifting them up and glorifying God or is it trying to sound like cheap therapy what about the prayers that are offered up what about the Lord's table what about the baptisms what about the giving of our offerings are all these are all these being honored or this is all part of the worship but we're so fixated on one element of it That we have began to lose sight of what true worship looks like and we begin to mock our God. And so while people are so fixated with what kind of music is being played, they don't really seem to have this focus on the type of sermons that are being preached. Uh, what's being said during the prayers and uh, uh, just uh, what, kind of, what type of worship dynamic there is. What's the theology behind this? Is, are, are we getting actually the word of God or not? What's the proper motivation? And so when we come to a building and say, boy, I hope they play the music that I like, or I can't worship to this kind of music, but I can only worship to that kind of music, we begin to mock God. When we come to a building where there's themes, I don't understand biker churches. I don't understand themed churches. It makes no sense to me. That sounds like creating an idol to oneself. Same with the heavy metal church. I don't get it. 
I don't, I don't understand that concept. Uh, uh, what makes you different? We're for bikers. Every church should be for bikers. But this one's exclusively bikers. We're for cowboys. We're for this. We're for that. Okay, so now we're talking about a specific style, but not about proper worship. It's all about drawing a specific kind of crowd and, and appealing to their taste rather than holiness. But so much of the contemporary church is a type like that as well. Give the people what they want. It's the same exact motivation. So if it's labeled a biker church or a heavy metal church, it's no different than the contemporary Christian church because they've done the same thing. It was all with the motivation of giving the people what they want. But never really considering the weight of proper worship. And when we refuse to do this, when we refuse to bring our worship and see that the songs that we sing, that the, 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 the type of songs that we sing, the preachers uh, and their sermons and, and how the word is communicated and, and how we do the ordinances and, and, and observe the ordinances, this is all an aspect of worship. And if we're not taking it seriously, then we make a mockery of God. And that's the theme for today is the mockery of God. Continuing on from what we left from last week, where they mocked Jesus as the king and how we too do the very same thing. Last week, we kind of talked about this, just this aspect of, of parenting and this aspect of, of, uh, of Christians flat out walking away from the faith, but in their own ignorance saying, I'm still a Christian, I believe in God, and yet I'm not going to honor God or obey his commands in any way. And how, uh, uh, how they say he is king, but they're really mocking him as king. Well, the same is true for those who don't practice those things and still find this places of worship without actually considering worship. We, we mock the king. And so picking up where we left off, verse 33. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. Now, I would like to continue, but we got to explain this. We do not know much about this place at all. And there are a few speculations. But not only do we not know a lot about this place, we don't even know if we're even having the proper pronunciation of that word itself. That's how little we know. It's been spelled many different ways. And the, the form that we are used to, that is more common in our language and is more common to what we've heard all of our lives, is not even the ancient form. We read it as Golgotha. And again, that's the typical way we, we would uh, announce it. You go to other English-speaking countries and, and it could be pronounced Golgotha at times. But then you look at the, 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 the variants of it, there's an, actually an, uh, a more common ancient form that we typically don't use where there's, there is an additional L right before the TH. So it'd be Golgotha with an L right before that. So a total of two Ls. And then there's people who, again, pronounce it in many different ways. It, it, it's surprising how... Little we actually know about that word. Um, and then um, we actually have not the slightest clue of, of its location. Um, and I think because of the difficulty behind that word in its Greek form, where Golgotha is, is being taken from the Greek, that we tend to stick with the Latin form of this. And the Latin form has become more popular than the Greek form. And the Latin is Calvary. So he was crucified on Calvary. We say Calvary rather than Golgotha. And Calvary is Latin for skull. It just means skull, not a place of a skull. It just means skull. And so here we have the word Golgotha. And Matthew tells us it means the place of the skull. We don't know why it's named that. And again, it's pure speculation on why it's named that. Um, some say it might be the normal execution site. And that's probably the most likely case. Some people believe that this is where the heads of certain people were buried. 
That's probably least likely as it was not a Jewish custom to decapitate people or separate their heads. It did become a later on Western thing where if somebody committed suicide and, and this, um, and I'm talking about Western culture driven by Catholicism too, by the way, guys. So if somebody committed suicide, it's like psh, chop their heads off. They ain't going to heaven. Even if they were already dead, like they're dead. They're like, okay, before you bury them, make sure you remove the head because they can't go to heaven. And that was the actual thought process. Um, and so like, uh, that's what the, the, uh, the, the, the Knight Templar and the Crusades, they would, they would actually do that for people who, um, were, um, who committed suicide of some sort or had some type of lifestyle that didn't match up, um, with the Catholic church. And so it's like, okay, you got to make sure you're, you know, lop that head off and before you, uh, before you bury them. Um, Sometimes it was a, the, the lopping of the head off and then burning of the body rather than burying of the body. And that was because, like, you know, if you burn the body, then they can't go to heaven. That was our thought. So a combination of no head and, uh, uh, and a burnt body meant you can't go to heaven. Um, there is, an, there is a, a, a saint that we read about in the New Testament who lost his head, who I very much believe is in heaven, by the way. And so I don't know where they got this thought process from, but it was a thought process that... If your head was removed, then you didn't get to heaven. Anyway, it was not common for Jewish people to do this, to separate the head from the body. So the, the, the idea that that was where they placed the heads of certain people, um, less likely. Um, and then there's the, those people who say that the hill itself kind of looked like a skull. And that can be a possible thing. That is one we will never know, though. We will never know if that's the case. It is common today that it, this area is believed to be under the, the site of a church in Jerusalem. Uh, we don't know for certain. The war, the battle that took place in 70 AD left uh, much of Jerusalem in ruins. And this actually included uh, even some of the, uh, uh, well, the landmarkings just completely destroyed. Um, and it was not the only battle they had in their history. That was a severe one. They had another severe one in around 150 AD, um, and just absolute complete destruction of, of buildings and the terrain. And so um, it was just completely destroyed. It's not the same location as it once was, just through different acts of warfare and then different types of construction that took place over the years. And so it is believed that this church sits underneath what used to be a hill but then they they leveled it off and so they they kind of filled in what used to be a hill and that hill was uh golgotha and then down at the bottom is probably where jesus was lifted up and crucified is what they believe there's a stone uh, that they that is in the ground right here and they believe that's probably where uh the cross was inserted into it, it's likely just based off the description um, uh, that we given in scripture because we we're told that Jesus was crucified just right outside of the gates of Jerusalem, pretty much right outside the fence line. He didn't have to go very far. And this specific location would have been uh, within a half a mile of where Pilate possibly could have judged Christ and announced the crucifixion. And so it's within reason to say that this is one of those places. Um, but again, we'll never know exactly what it looked like uh, if that is the exact spot. Um, we just don't know. If that is the correct spot, then then it, uh, then a church sits on top of it and where Jesus would have been crucified would have been underneath that. Um, again, uh, some people say that the hill may, may look like a skull, which may be the reason why it's singular, not plural. It is, a, it is a place of the skull, not skulls, and so it is singular, and so they say, well, that highlights something, but again, there's no way for us to know. Verse 34, they gave him wine to drink mixed with gall, and after tasting it, he did not want to drink. Not every translation reads the same. The translation that I have says is that it was a drink mixed with gall. That's... Probably a more accurate English or Greek to English translation. Other translations might kind of give you what that would uh, like more of an interpretation. Like, okay, this would have been a wine setting, and so it'll say wine with vinegar at times. Gall was a bile that came from the gall bladder, and they they would have if if it was if it was bile from a gall bladder, it probably would have came from a cow of some sort. But in this day, it was actually used as a description to describe something that was bitter. 
And so just because somebody says it was gall does not necessarily mean it was bile from a gall bladder. It means it was something bitter. Uh, history tells us a little something, and th this is probably more likely, which is why people go for more of interpretation. But they would say that uh, uh, a wine that had something like uh, myrrh or frankincense uh, um, soaking in it would, would bring bitter to the wine. And so they would call it, uh, they would call it a gall wine, even though there's no actual bile from a gall in it. It's just bitter. Um, and so uh, the description here, it could be uh, to, to describe bile. It's not just, not just uh, uh, a bitter, but something that's sour as well. It's a little sour. And so that's where the vinegar comes in place too. Now we know from history that the Romans did like to keep vinegar on hand. And they, they actually kept it on hand when it came to crucifixions especially. They kept it on hand for themselves too. But it was believed in ancient times that a type of diluted vinegar drink, typically diluted with wine at times, would prolong life. So it, they, were, they would keep it on hand with the crucifixion because they would give it to drink to the people. Um, and then it would prolong their life only to make the suffering last longer. So the Romans would typically have some type of wine slash vinegar mixture. And it could have bitter herbs in it as well, such as wormwood and frankincense or even myrrh. And again, this was all for the purpose of prolonging life. This is what they believed it would do, that it would prolong life if you drank it. The Romans actually used it for their own consumption as well. When it was a high heat day and they, they, they needed a form of rapid hydration, this is what they drank for rapid hydration. Um, and so it was... It was uh, you had the herbs in there, which typically provide minerals, and then you had you had this vinegar and wine mixture. I recently learned through a, a safety program that pickle juice is a is a very good liquid to drink for rapid hydration. Uh, you have to have water in it with it. You can't just strictly drink pickle juice. Uh, but uh, if you're really feeling dehydrated, taking take drinking some pickle juice and having some water is a way to have rapid hydration. The pickle juice has vinegar aspect to it, which apparently helps and helps to rush it faster. Um, but also there's salt in there, um, salt being needed for hydration. Uh, it also contains a lot of minerals from the cucumber soaking in there and then like the dill being present in there and the different types of seasoning, depending on what kind of pickles you get. But uh, um, they, they would have all that elements you would need to for rapid hydration. So. I think the Romans probably were onto something about that. That it, it, it may may seem kind of far fetched, but it they 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 had this belief, and it wasn't just the Romans that believed this. The Jewish people believed this as well. And so, for it taken into history into consideration, the reason why it was there at the cross in the first place was that it was a it was another tool of it was another tool of torture to prolong the life. Because you would dehydrate on the cross for sure. And so you're bringing hydration and uh, it's meant to prolong the life. And this can actually be the reason why Jesus was unwilling to drink it. It, it, it. He tasted it and he was unwilling to drink it is what we're told. And the common thought is that it tasted terrible. But if this was a normal drink for hydration and it had the belief that it prolonged your life, um, it could be that what happened is that when Jesus took a taste of it, he knew what that was, and he refused. He refused to have it on the aspect of like, I'm not trying to prolong this. What's going on here? I'm not looking to extend what's going on here, and so he refused to drink it. That could be one of the reasons why, because Jesus was not looking to prolong anything on the cross. It's clear, though, that he 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 did have a desire to drink. He had great thirst because he would. Uh, he went for it in the first place, but then when he tasted what it was, he decided, no, I don't want that. But it is clear there was he had to have had some type of intense sensation of thirst while on the cross, which uh, no doubt, it's, it's in the middle of the day, it's, 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 it's high heat, you're in the Middle East, it's very dry climate. Um, I have no doubt that there was this, just this intensity of thirst taking place there. But as soon as he tasted the liquid that was meant to prolong the situation, he refused to drink it. Verse 35. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. This is a brutal act. 
where the gospel writers just say he was crucified. They don't go into great detail what that looks like. We use history to help us understand what that looks like. They would extend the arms out really tight. And they will either nail the hands or the palms into the wrist. History tells us both were done. In the 20th century, though, we had people proclaim, supposed experts, it's not even possible for a person to have nails driven into their hands and support the weight of a human body. That aspect is true, by the way. And so what they made the conclusion was is that it could not be possible for Jesus to have nails driven to his hands. Well, they forget one important aspect is that uh, they roped the arms on the cross as well. It's not the entire weight of the body being held by the hands. It's just part of the execution process. They rope the arms around the body, around the rope the arms around the cross as well, and the ropes are helping support the body, not just the nails either in the hands or the wrist. And so it's not entire body weight being held this way. Um, and they actually kind of hurt their own theory in this aspect because crucifixion is meant to be a slow suffocation. Um, if, if they pierce the wrist with the type of nails that they had, uh, the really thick, big nails, and your entire body weight is being held up by your wrist, you're going to bleed out really fast. But it's not supporting the entire body weight. There's ropes that actually keep your arms more up like this, not hanging like this, but keep your arms more like this. And all the body weight's not on the wrist either, so you're not risking bleeding out. If all your body weight is on your wrist, you're stretching out that hole and bleeding it out. You get, you're allowing that blood to come out. And so they kind of hurt their own theory by saying that, that, that this does not exist. But the idea is not to hang from the wrist, is to have your arms straightened out as tight as they can. And so it's not the nails holding up the body. This is a miserable death. It was, it's a slow suffocation. They would also drive a nail through the feet. They would put the feet together and they would use this long nail to get both feet with one nail. There was a point in time also, also in the 20th century, early 20th century, where historians said, cannot be done this way. It would not happen this way. And then they found, they, 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 they found bones with the nail driven right through it. And that specific, that specific nail was actually right through the heel of the foot. So right through that heel bone, the nail poked out. You can only imagine the type of pain of having your feet nailed and it come out of the heel bone. But they found a preserved bone that was to both, both bones where they were still nailed together and then the nail was still in them. And so while these historians are saying cannot be, uh, God shows them. The act of crucifixion is slowly suffocating. It's meant to be a very form slow of torture. They would put a little brace underneath their foot too. So like it wasn't, again, their body weight, uh, their body weight wasn't being held by the nail in the foot as well. There was a brace underneath them. And again, their arms stretched out tight with ropes around the arms, not, not hanging from the weight of their hands or the wrist, but more like this where it's supported. And when they're on there and they, when they go to slump down, they're slowly suffocating. Could take days, can take weeks at times. They would lift themselves up to gasp in air. It was, it was a futile experience, but here's the thing. Even if you are suicidal, you cannot bring yourself to die this way because you're, everything in your body is going to say, breathe. And so you're going to lift yourself up and... Take that short breath, but you're slowly suffocating even though you get this shortness of breath because you can't breathe continuously. And so it's a slow suffocation process. If they wanted to speed it up, they would break the legs of the people, which we read about in Scripture. They would break the legs because breaking of the legs would prevent them from lifting up and breathing in. So when they break the legs, they're just slumped down all the time, slowly suffocating still. They don't suffocate right away, but they will suffocate. You can still breathe, but you can't breathe well. 
and you will slowly suffocate. It is an agonizing process. The way that they would do it is they would lay you on the ground. They would nail, they would nail your hands. They would stretch them out as tight as they can, nail the hands or the wrist, tie rope real tight around your arms. They would then, they would, uh, they, they would uh, nail your feet into to the beam of the cross as well and then get support underneath there. They would then have a pre-made hole, which is why it's usually in the same site if they can, if they can control it. There's a pre-made hole, and you gotta imagine like you're putting a, like a post to a fence into the hole. That's what they're doing with the cross. They're raising it up and inserting it into a pre-made hole. And that's how they get them. So they're nailed when they're onto the ground and strapped while they're on the ground. And then they get the base of the cross near that pre-made um, be of the pre-made hole and then they use rope to hoist them up they lifted up our lord and it was secured in, in place where he hung and that entire process has to be agonizing as well the, the shaking the vibrating the the, the cross going and you're nailed on all sides and you and, and you've been tortured right before this point as well you're feeling every little bit a vibration crucifixion is 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 a, is a terrible death but then we read that they divided up his garments among themselves and casting lots to figure out who was going to get it they were gambling now the reason why they were dividing up his garments and gambling over the garments was because at crucifixion you were completely stripped down I know all of our art and all of our movies depict some type of loincloth of some sort, but that's not what would have happened. That would not be true to history. The purpose of a crucifixion was not only to be a slow, horrendous death, it was meant to be the most embarrassing death. This is what they did to our Lord. They stripped him down completely. nailed him to a cross, lifted him up, and then gambled over his garments right in front of him. This is what our sin has done to our Lord. The God of all creation, experiencing one of the most heinous and embarrassing deaths that mankind can ever endure, that the most embarrassing and heinous death that mankind can even come up with, and then the soldiers again began to gamble over his garments right in front of them as he was there exposed and shamed for our crimes. It wasn't just the death, it was the embarrassment. He took a type of embarrassment on our behalf. Verses 36 and 37. Sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there, and above his head they put up the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. They would have sat. It would have been, um, it would have been a type of judgment. When you sit while somebody is being crucified, you're standing over them as a type of judge. This would have been Pilate too, by the way. He would have been there from start to finish, from the very moment... They tortured him to this very moment to where he, they, he watched him take the last breath. Pilate would have been there the entire time. This was all under his watchful eye. And he would have been at the head seat of judgment seat over the God of all creation. And as they sat there and watched him, which is what their job was to do, was to watch in judgment. It was common in crucifixion to place the charge of what they did around them and they put this jesus they, they, they this is this is jesus the king of the jews now they're mocking jesus still but it seems like they're also mocking the jewish people it seems like Pilate may still not you know he's still not at ease with what's going on here and now he's trying to really insult them but in his attempt to insult the Jews, he's also insulting Jesus. It's meant to be a form of mockery. They're not serious about this in any way. And so here, 
is not just the king of the Jews, but the king of all. They've already mocked him as a king. And they still cannot help themselves from mocking him as a king further. And this is the tragedy of, of, of uh, fallen creatures, sinful man, not knowing what they're doing, and yet at the same time being faithful slaves to the sin that enslaves them. That's the power of sin. That it makes you an obedient slave and you act in a way that you may not even consider you're acting, but that's how uh, sin works. It enslaves you. Your will is not autonomous to sin. And sin will enslave you in this way where you will behave in such a way and not even realizing it. These men were probably laughing and having a good time. And they will find that one day that the one they hung on the cross and they sat in judgment over will one day judge them. They've already found this out, by the way. And they're going to find out what they actually did to not only the king of the Jews, but the king of all, their own king. They didn't recognize him as king. They didn't acknowledge him as king. What they will find is that he is king. Despite their beliefs, despite their thoughts, despite what they think, he is king. King worthy of proper worship, not the mockery that they did. And that's where we need to consider worship in general. Because if we don't come with a proper attitude, then our attitude is mockery as well. Now here, I, I opened up with, with, with the attitude of, of coming to worship. It had nothing to really do with the music itself. It has to do with the attitude when we come to this. When we come together and, and when we're worshiping God, are we coming with the proper reverent attitude? Do we really worship the king? Or is that just mockery and we don't actually acknowledge him as king? We're just like the Romans and we're putting Jesus the king of the Jews and all hail the king of the Jews, right? But then there's something I didn't mention. Consider what is taking place here. Consider the cross. Consider the mockery. Consider the torture. Now consider Catholicism. And how at every single Catholic Mass, they believe that they are doing this over and over again. Which is why their symbolism still has Jesus on the cross because the Catholic Mass doctrine is they are re-crucifying Jesus every single Sunday. And that is for that reason why when they come to the Lord's table, they are literally but invisibly feeding off the flesh and blood of Jesus. They have a doctrine where they are repeating this act of our Lord, the King of all, being stripped of his clothing, exposed and ashamed before the world, nailed to this cross, slowly suffocating, and they call it worship. They call it good. This is why we can't have a type of fellowship with Catholics like some Christians believe we can have. This is why I can't attend a Catholic service because I know what they're doing there. Contrary to the attitude, I can worship God wherever, fine, I can too, but I refuse to be in a place where they make mockery of Jesus. Because then I would not be properly worshiping God. And while 
I know Catholic doctrine enough to know, hey, you know what? What they believe is going on up there. And I don't think a lot of people in the pews know what's going on. I know what that priest believes. I know what that priest was taught. And I know what he has going on in mind. And he will announce, behold, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. And that is the beginning of the process of the re-crucifixion of Jesus. And then they will hand out, they will have everyone come up for communion. I know exactly what they're doing. I know it's barbaric in thought, and I know that I cannot be a part of it. But likewise, the positive setting, where it's not as brutal, where it's not as ugly looking, but it's a bright place with a well-lit up stage. But the same type of mockery just kind of covered up in more nicer language they don't believe he's being re-crucified again but they will mock our lord with their false worship now this is not a general i'm not making a statement about all contemporary churches that's not the case technically we are a contemporary church as we live in contemporary times and technically the hymns that we sing are at were at one point contemporary christian music okay that's how time works and so it's not a thing about what is new and what is old. But it's a thing about what is proper and what is improper. And if it's improper, we need to begin to look at it as something ugly. As ugly as the Romans mocking Jesus. As ugly as the Romans sitting in a judgment seat over our crucified Jesus. Who again, they stripped completely down and then sat and watched him in judgment. False worship, mockery worship is ugly. And just because we painted up with a very expensive show and talented musicians does not make it any less ugly. This was something that John Gill pointed out. And he mourned for the state and condition. This was back in the 18th century. John Gill wrote this in the 18th century. And he mourned over the state and condition. And he goes, how wicked it is when people make a mockery of worship. And how much so they act like these Romans. And so now we must consider it all. It's not just the style of worship. It's our attitude towards worship. It's our attitude towards Jesus. It's our attitude as Christians in general. When we are not faithful to the commands that he has given, then we are behaving like these people. And we think we stand in judgment over the crucified Christ. And how so many people in these settings make these kinds of judgments. Because it's not just the style of worship that comes into play. It's what follows within these type of ministries as well. Well, I think Jesus would be for, and then you fill in the blank. And if I have the attitude yesterday of, you know what, we got to give the type of music that people know because that's what they're drawn to and that's what that's going to bring them in. I know the attitude tomorrow is we got to embrace this next sin because that's what's going to bring the people in. That is the issue of compromising. That is the issue of not being God-centered in our worship. And if we got preachers leading this way, it is a problem. This is how we're losing. This is why we have churches that have little rainbow colors outside their buildings. It's through a series of compromises. But it's all a form of mockery towards the king. And they are no different than the Romans standing in judgment over Christ while he is crucified. They too are saying, we will say what Jesus is for and what he isn't for. Well, what about his word? Doesn't his word, uh -uh, we will say what Jesus is for and what he isn't for. Showing the same degree of heinousness. And they do it in the name of love. But it's ugly. 
And God's people can see it's ugly. But most of all, it's an ugliness that God sees more than anyone. And so we need to really consider what worship is and not be the ones guilty of the same type of mockery. We need to start putting these images into our own lives and understanding that, hey, you know what? We are a little bit more connected to these type of people than we think we are. I mean, I don't think that the Jewish leaders that, that were yelling crucify him and demanding his crucifixion and the freedom of Barabbas felt like they were doing something evil in any way. I think they had their own ways of justifying their actions, just like people today have their own ways of justifying actions. We look at that, we read that, we go, oh, how heinous, how evil. Not me. Yes, you too. You too. We all have a way of explaining away our actions sometimes. Defending our actions. Thinking we're right in our own mind. And it's the same kind of ugliness that we refuse to impart onto ourselves. It's the same kind of ugliness we refuse to impart onto our loved ones. That yes, you are guilty of this same thing. But this very ugliness that we see in how they raised him, this very cross, is going to be the symbol of of forgiveness and forgiving the very things that we are guilty of that look just like what they do, the Romans do. That's the marvelous beauty of the crucifixion is that it is a, it is, it, it, it's one of the, it's one of these images that is so heinous and ugly and yet so beautiful at the same time. We as Christians, we've kind of dulled our senses a little bit there was this painting. I used to have a digital copy of it. I loved it. And I shared it years ago, years and years ago on Facebook. I think it was Facebook. And people were like, how morbid. And what it was is it was, you seen skeletons, skeletons, skeletons. And then you seen some skeletons with a little bit of flesh. And as, as it kept getting closer and closer, more and more skeletons were getting flesh. And then you see a, a hand raising up. It's very zombie looking almost. It was an old painting. It was not a it was not a modern day painting. It was the Valley of Dry Bones from Ezekiel. The dead coming to life. And I was like, what? What a gorgeous thing. And people were like, ugh. <laughs> you know, like that's that don't look Christian at all. No, it's very Christian. I wish I still had it. Because it was on an older Facebook that I got rid of. I wish I still had it and I wish I could find it again because it was it was just that neat of a picture. And the last guy to have flesh on him, there's a light coming from heaven upon him. That's what salvation looks like, first of all, folks. But I think we kind of dulled our senses a little bit and we kind of we kind of missed we miss what is beauty and, and ugliness, and the cross is one of those things. And it's, it's one of these paradoxes that only God can do. It's like God, God is going to be the one to take something so heinous, so evil, and make it something so beautiful at the same time to the point where so many of us wear those symbols on our bodies. And we go, oh, yes, I have this cross because it reminds me of Jesus. But that was an instrument of torture at one point. Now a symbol of love. And that's something that only God can do in, this, in, in this, this broken and fallen world. I'm going to take something so heinous and make it so beautiful at the same time. And that's the beauty of the cross. So even if we do fail in these areas and we realize, yes, I'm the one who's been guilty of making this type of mockery towards God, that cross reminds me that I've been forgiven of that type of mockery. If the repentance is genuine. The repentance is not, I'm sorry God for doing this to you and then I will continue to mock you, but I will, I will now serve you. That's what repentance looks like. And so while these 
these men are mocking God and they're calling him the king of the Jews, they're telling the truth. They're displaying a type of truth. And to them, while they sit in judgment over Christ, proclaiming this truth, not knowing that's what they're doing, they have actually heaped more judgment upon themselves. Along the whole way, this, all these acts they're doing, heaping more judgment upon themselves. But now we have the cross as the center point of history. It is the center of all time. And it's a historical event, which means God has entered time and space in the form of flesh, in the form of Jesus Christ, and has left his footprint in history. And he has left it there for all to research and discover and be rewarded and blessed through that research and discovery. And it is now the center point of all time. All of time was leading up to that point. And we now look back at that point. It is now the crucial point of the time frame of human beings as it was for the redemption of human beings. We got more to discuss about this day. And we have ended our topic on the mockery of Jesus as far as worship goes. Now we will, next week, begin to go more into the theology of the cross. Let's pray. Father God, I am thankful for today's message, Lord, but I also mourn the condition of the church. and Lord, even for ourselves, too, like just how often we are prone to fall short and how often we are prone to sin, Lord, you are faithful to forgive. And Lord, I... The last thing I want to do and the last thing I want anyone here to do is mock you and worship in ignorance. But Lord, you have edified us, you have lifted us up, and you have led us and you educate us on what is good and what is proper. And so Lord, I pray that we really consider our motives, our attitudes, our actions, all of that, Lord, when we come to a place of worship. And really consider what is being said and what is being communicated and what is being sung, what is being practiced. And Lord, I pray that uh, our worship is always sincere. It's always reverent. And it's always just in complete dedication to you. Forgive us in the ways that we fall short. Forgive us for our past failures as well. Strengthen us and make us stronger so that our worship may always be true and authentic before you. And then on the day you call us home, uh, Lord, you, uh, you give us those words well done as we've been faithful to our King and not making a mockery of you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.